and then get right into the message. I'm going to do a doctrinal teaching message today. I'm going to feed the flock and pastoring and teaching. And what I will do is sometimes we're teaching somebody something they may have never heard. Maybe you're here this morning, you've never heard teaching on the doctrine of the resurrection. You've heard about the resurrection, but you've never really been taught the doctrine. Maybe uh, you're just needing uh, that affirmed in your life or confirmed and, you know, just strengthened in that. And so either way about it, we pray that God will use this day in your life. Sometimes, you know, preaching is just reminding people of what they already know. And reconfirming that and restrengthening that in their life. John chapter 11, Lazarus has died. He's the brother of Mary and Martha and he died. Jesus purposely did not come and, uh, in time to uh, save his life in the, in the eyes of, of, of those sisters. And I want to get through all that in verse number 25. It says this, but let's hit verse 23. Verse 23, the sisters have been almost, almost accusing Jesus of neglecting, caring about them. And verse 23, Jesus saith unto her, thy brother shall rise again. You ought to underline that if you've got loved ones that's gone on to glory. You ought to underline that. Thy brother, or maybe it's thy mother, or maybe it's thy father, if they're saved, shall rise again. And uh, Martha saith to him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection of the last day. Now listen, folks, most of the New Testament had not been written at this time. The Old, the Old Testament saying they knew about resurrection. Don't think they did. Job said, I'll see him. I'll stand in the latter day. In my flesh, I'll see him. Job knew that he was going to be resurrected. Uh, they understood that. And she said, I know that. Verse number 25, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Verse 26 says, and whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? You know why Jesus, Jesus said, believest thou this? Because that's a tough one. You better read that and careful. If you get saved, can I tell you some good news this morning? You ain't never going to die. You say, Reggie, I've seen saved people die. You, all you see them do is move out of that old body and move into glory. They never die. They've been given eternal life. All right. And uh, by, by verse number seven, she said unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ. Flip back over to John chapter five real quick. John chapter five and verse number 28. John chapter five and verse number 28. Jesus says here, marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the graves. Did you hear that? All that are in the graves shall hear his voice. Now, somebody got the bright idea of being cremated and said, I'll escape the resurrection. I'll burn myself up. Sorry, it ain't going to happen. God's going to get you. Amen. Uh, by the way, can I just say something to you? We're, this is Resurrection Sunday. Don't be cremated. That's a heathen pagan practice. I don't care, what, I don't care if your favorite uncle had, was, had himself burned up. Don't be cremated. Uh, we're buried, amen? The gospel is a burial and a resurrection. You say, well, that's trying to, I think that a lot of that's just about trying to get away from being resurrected. And somebody, well, it costs a lot less. Well, no, no, no. Get buried real quick. And within 24 hours, no hard cost you nothing to get buried. So I don't swallow that either. But uh, let me just say this to you, that the fish that eat the bodies of the people who went down in ships, what are you going to do with that? See? And so the resurrection, God will bring you out, buddy. Your ashes is going to come together. God's going to bring you up, all right? And he said, all that, all that are in the grace shall hear his voice. They shall come forth. They that have done good on the resurrection life, they that have done evil on the resurrection damnation. Now, uh, Jesus, uh, to clarify that, don't think that if you're good, you go to heaven, you're bad, you go to hell. That's not what that's teaching. That ask him what you do, do you know, about being good. He said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You want to do one thing you can do is good. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, go to 1 Corinthians. And 15, and we're going to get it read a pretty long passage of scripture and get right into the message and roll and go the best that we can. I'll tell you what, I appreciate you being here today, but I appreciate God being here more than anything. First Corinthians 15, everybody there say amen. amen. Verse number 12, verse number 12. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? Had a problem going on. Uh, in their world, they had some people uh, even in the church saying that there was no resurrection of the dead. Verse 13, but if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then our preaching is vain and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ. Whom he raised not up, if so be the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. 
Now tonight I'm going to preach detail by detail on this passage of scripture. This morning I'm going to preach in general, but tonight I'll go into detail about if he's not raised and if he is raised. Okay, those issues. Verse 18, then also they which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man, that's Adam, by man Christ came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. By the way, there's the doctrine, if you're, even if you're lost, the reason you're coming up from the dead, even as a lost person, is because Je- Jesus, it was caused, his resurrection caused that. You see, he, it's not just the saved people that are going to be resurrected. All men, all mankind is going to be resurrected, but they're resurrected under two different resurrections specifically. Now, we'll talk about that again tonight too. But every man after his own order, Christ the first fruits. Afterwards, they, the, Christ at his coming, that's what we call the rapture of the church. Then verse 24, then come at the end, which is referring to Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 to 15, the great white throne judgment. So you have Christ the first fruits, then the church is resurrected out. Then you have the lost being resurrected at the great white throne judgment in Revelation chapter 20. Then verse then it says this, then come at the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. We're going to jump for time's sake this morning down to verse 35. But some men will say, how are the dead raised up and with what body do they come? Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened except it die. You cannot get corn to grow up in your garden unless you plant a seed in there and that seed dies. All right. Now that's what he's saying. Listen, you ought to know that. Verse number 37. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body which shall be. But bear grain, it may chance of wheat or some other grain. But God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and every seed his own body. The question they were asking, well, all right, if you're resurrected, what are you going to be like when you're resurrected? All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another fishes, another of birds. Verse 40, there are celestial bodies, there are bodies terrestrial, but the glory of the celestial is one, the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars. For one star differs from another star in glory. And he says all that to say this. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. Now, by the way, let's just get honest about it. When your body dies, if they don't embalm you, you are going to rot. And worms and bugs are just going to take over. And you're just going to go and... and, uh, uh, I uh, had a man one time tell me about finding uh, a close relative of his dead in the house. He said, Reggie, literally was a pool of oil. Been there so long, just a piece of oil. Basically, is the best way I know to describe it. But you go out here, now, it, in the situation he's in because it was cool in the house. But if you're out here on the side of the road, you know what happens to a possum. Okay? And that's why Paul talks about this vile body and the corruptible body. But I want to tell you, the body is a very precious thing. It's to be taken care of. We're made in the image of God, and it's the temple of the Holy Spirit. And we're not animals and we don't drag people off in the ditch. We bury them because they have a sacred body and that body is going to be resurrected and changed. And you don't never de- de- degrade the human body. You reverence this, uh, this, the creation of God. But he said it's, it's sown in corruption and we know that's true. But it is raised in something. It's raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. And that's what Jesus Christ had. Now, that does not mean that he did not have a tangible body. What it does mean that a spiritual body can go through obstacles, go through places and things like that that you can't in the body that you have. The Bible said that we'll have a body fashioned like unto his glorious body. That's in Philippians chapter 2. And I don't understand all about it other than the fact that he, they recognized who he was. We'll be known as we're known. They also could look on the scars that Jesus Christ had. He told Thomas, he said, reach hither and feel my side. You touch me. He said he had the scars of his crucifixion in that spiritual body. But that spiritual body is not limited as like you and I have a physical body now. Let me tell you something. It's going to be a wonderful, wonderful thing and you don't want to miss it. Amen. Amen. He said it's a spiritual body. There, and I say all that to say that there are some people who try to tell you that you will not have a manifested physical body. 
a body. You won't have a tangible body at the resurrection. That's not true. You will have, but it's beyond the physical that you have now. It is a spiritual body and a body is a body. Okay. But it has abilities and a phenomenon that you don't have now. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written. The first man, Adam was made a living soul. The last Adam, which is Christ was made a quickening spirit. How be it? That was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthly. The second man is the Lord in heaven. We're talking about the old man, new man, flesh, the old, the old body, new body. All right, new man. As it is earthly, such as they that are earthly, as is the heavenly, so are they that are heavenly. Watch verse 49. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, that's the first Adam, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. That's the second Adam. We're going to bear the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why in the epistles it says that we'll have a body fashioned like unto his glorious body. Okay. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot enter the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In other words, these, we're going to be changed from this. And it tells it in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised, how? Incorruptible, and we shall be what? Those of us who are still living shall be changed. God is going to translate us. We're going to drop this fleshly body, and we will put on, God will, will, will put upon us a new spiritual glorified body like in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's a wonderful thing. The older you get, the more pains you have and problems you have, the more that it looks attractive to you, okay? And verse number 53, for this corruptible, speaking of those that are dead, must put on incorruption. And this mortal, speaking of those who are still alive, must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, this mortal shall have put on immortality. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, help us to preach today in a way that glorify you and your word uh, to the saving of souls and the building up of the saints. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. They call today, and I've said it myself, Easter. That is not true. This is not Easter. But we've been conditioned to call it that, and it's no big sin if you call it Easter. But to be honest about it, just to be absolutely straight, gun barrel straight honest, this is not Easter. The world is wrong again. They call it Good Friday a couple of days ago, speaking of the day of Christ's crucifixion, and that is wrong. And it, isn't it amazing how wrong the world gets everything, and how the devil brings in substitutes, you know, to, and so forth. Easter uh, is, a, uh, is mentioned in the Bible and it is not the Passover in Acts chapter 12. It is a pagan Roman holiday that occurred around the time of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I could get into some issues on that when somebody starts telling you that the word Easter is in the Bible and that's, that proves the Bible's got a wrong word in it. They don't know. That tells you that. It, just trust me. If you want to know this, you come talk and I'll show you. It tells you. I'll, I'll just throw this at you. This Bible was written or put together by this, and this, this got the King James authorized version inside, okay? It has a lot of footnotes and references by C.I. Schofield, supposedly one of the greatest theologians of all time. C.I. Schofield did not believe the Bible. And by the way, can I tell you something further? He had probably more degrees than all the preachers of Springfield put together, but did not believe and did not know a lot much about the Bible that the average, average Bible reading person out here knows. And I'll tell you why. Because he gave a reference in Acts chapter 12 to Easter and if we go to the refer reference in the Schofield Bible, it will say, should, should have said Passover. It should not have said Passover. And I'll tell you why. The verse above it tells you that it was in the days of the, it was in the, days of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The Feast of Unleavened Bread comes after the Passover. The Passover is the very first feast. And it was telling you the exact truth that the, the celebration of Easter, Easter, a pagan holiday, was getting ready to come. That's when he was going to release Peter out of prison to satisfy the pagans. C.I. Schofield, the man who supposedly puts his Bible together, says they should have said Passover. And don't know what he's talking about. Isn't that amazing? I want to say something to him. This is why God says knowledge puffeth up. Instead of really studying scripture out, you would have thought a man like C.I. Schofield would have looked back at the feast when he read that verse above it and said, all right, we've got to get this right with the feast. And he instantly saw what was going on. But instead cast doubt upon the word of God. 
Well, I said all that to say this. We call it Easter. It's not really Easter. It's Resurrection Sunday. We, for Bible-believing Christian people, those that are saved, this is a celebration, remembrance of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The fact that he is alive, that he is risen, that he is triumphant over death, hell, and the grave. And that we who are in Christ enter into that victory and that triumph over death, hell, and the grave in Jesus Christ. And we are to be risen in newness of life. The resurrections of the Bible, there are several of them in the Bible, run through them very quick. There's a resurrection of Jesus Christ. But there's also a spiritual resurrection of the saved person who is born again. The Bible said we're risen in newness of life in Jesus Christ. And there's a resurrection that happens when you get saved. It's called a spiritual resurrection. A new life is born. A new creature is made in Jesus Christ. But there's the physical resurrection of the saints of God. That's in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 through 17. What we often attempt to describe the rapture of the church when the saints of God are raptured, are raptured out and are resurrected up that are dead. The fourth resurrection in the Bible is the resurrection of the nation of Israel. It's a national resurrection. It has two aspects to it. One is, a, one is physical. The other is spiritual. The physical resurrection of Israel happened on May 14, 1948. It was a result of the prophecy of Ezekiel about the Valley of the Dry Bones. The spiritual aspect of the nation of Israel's resurrection will occur when Jesus Christ comes in glory at the end of the tribulation period and they'll look upon him whom they have pierced and they will be converted to the Lord Jesus Christ and it will be a spiritual resurrection of the nation of Israel. The fifth resurrection in the Bible is in Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15, where the Bible said, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. God had resurrected them out of their graves and those who had died lost down through history. And they stand before the great white throne of God and they are judged according to their works. And there's only one place they go and that's the lake of fire. Okay. That is the judgment and the resurrection and the judgment of the dead lost. If you're here today and you're lost and not saved and you die in that condition, you will be in hell until the great white, the resurrection of the dead lost and resurrected to stand before the great white throne of God. And because you believed your works would save you. God's going to judge you by your works and you'll find out it could not save you. There were in the Bible pre-shadows or types of the resurrection in the Old Testament. Uh, Moses was resurrected. The Bible said in the New Testament that Ark, the, uh, 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 disputed with Satan over the body of Moses. There's typologies about the resurrection. Lazarus in the New Testament was resurrected as a picture of the resurrection of a lost man. In newness of life. There were saints that were resurrected. In the street and walked the streets of Jerusalem. When Jesus Christ died on the cross. So there's a lot about resurrection in it. But not, let's look at number one. And I, I'm, I'm doing this for a reason. Uh, I don't know how long. You know God will keep us all on scene. But I want these young people in this church. It may not mean much to you today. But I can promise you this. When you get to be 50 and 60 years old. And, and you're starting to head down the trail of life. And you've been hit and you realize that, that life without God is vanity. You're going to want to know that you know the truth. I don't want you attending this church without having been taught the doctrine of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the importance of it. Because if you can get a hold of the doctrine of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and lay it and cement it in your soul, no one will ever jerk you around very much. You'll get that down. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is a cardinal bedrock doctrine pillar of the Christian faith. Now listen to me carefully this morning. All other doctrines concerning Jesus Christ stand or fall upon his resurrection. For Jesus Christ is not resurrected from the dead. His deity collapses. He is not God. If Jesus Christ did not raise from the dead, he was not virgin born. And he's not God and not our Savior. If he did not raise from the dead, he did not live a sinless life and therefore could not be our Savior. If he is not risen from the dead, his vicarious, substitutional, sacrificial death on the cross was wasted and meaningless and powerless if he did not raise from the dead. In fact, it meant nothing whatsoever. Jesus Christ resurrection from the dead, if it, 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 it means nothing apart from his righteousness and his holiness. And his current high priestly ministry doctrine means nothing to us. He could not be our high priest, ever living to make intercession for you and I right now, if he's not risen from the dead. Is this making sense? 
There's nothing the Bible teaches about Jesus Christ that will stand and hold if the doctrine of the resurrection is not true. Old timers, old time preachers, especially on Easter, used to hammer home in the early days of America the great pillar of the resurrection. And here's the reason your forefathers built churches all over this country is because they believed in the bodily resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and they knew that if the resurrection was true, everything else could hold. But if that fell down, everything was gone. All of these doctrines I've just mentioned are, are not valid if Jesus Christ is not risen. You will find out reading the book of Acts, from Acts chapter 2, from the first message Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, to the last message preached in the book of Acts, that they continuously preached on the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that he was risen from the dead. Now, there, what about the proof and the veracity and the reality of our faith? It rests upon the pillar of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to, not because I'm preaching, I'm nobody to listen to, but because of this book and the importance of it to your life, I would like for you to listen very intently right now. You need to know that the proof and the veracity, or in other words, the truthfulness, the reality of our faith, rest upon the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Get this. The reality of your faith does not rest upon your feelings. It never will. Number two, the reality of your faith does not rest upon your performance. Nor does it rest upon the performance of other people. Are you listening to me? Let me tell you what blows people out of the water. What, how somebody treated me this way. Somebody treated me that way. And they're supposed to be a Christian. A preacher did this and a preacher did that. And a Sunday school teacher did this. And, and it blows you out of the water. You know why it blew you out of the water? Because you weren't resting your faith upon the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You were basing your faith upon your performance and the performance of other professing Christians. And it's tearing thousands of people down right now. Tearing people to shreds. Because their faith is placed upon their feelings or upon the performance of people. Your faith is not resting upon the, your emotions because your emotions fly up and down like the kites. Please listen to me today. There are going to be times when you're at your house or at work or in your car or standing at your kitchen window and all of life is blowing apart and everything that you thought was wonderful is gone. And, you're, and, and there's the storms, the spiritual storms of life are blowing at the pillars of your faith. And I'm telling you from a personal experience and from this book that the only thing that will hold you in the storm of trial of your faith, he is risen from the dead. Learn it. Write it on your soul. He is risen from the dead. That is the basis of my faith, the basis of my hope. Without that, everything else you have is gone. This will hold you when your emotions aren't very well. Your faith is not based upon your answered or unanswered prayers. I've had people run out of waiting rooms and IC units and grab me by the coat and grab me by the shirt and pull me to the floor. Oh, Reggie, pray with me that God will spare my loved one. Oh, God, please spare them. And do you know what? Many times God has not answered those prayers the way I wanted them pray, answered. But my faith does not stand in whether God answers my prayer to get a job next week. My faith anchors in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Neither does my faith rest upon my health. Nor does it rest upon my sickness. Nor does it rest upon my wealth or poverty. Your faith must rest in the reality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ or you do not have saving Bible faith. And we wonder today why so many people are blown around like just kites and, and stuff in the air and leaves in the autumn wind. It's because their faith is resting in things that God never told them to rest their faith in. It rests your faith in the risen Savior because when everything else is gone, 
That will hold you. When Satan's fiery darts and doubt and unbelief are fired at your heart, take the shield of faith. Take the sword of the Spirit and say he lives. He's risen from the dead, therefore I believe. Abraham staggered not at the promises of God. He is risen from the dead. Sometimes you need to say that when you're fighting your spiritual warfare. He is risen from the dead. The Bible said he is alive forevermore. And because he lives, I live and shall live. Then the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we see in it the absolute superiority of the Christian faith over all other religions and beliefs of the world. The world's religions, none of them have a risen founder or a risen leader or a risen savior. Not one of them. If you want to see a Muslim tuck tail and run, ask him where Muhammad's body's at. Only Christianity, Bible Christianity, has a Savior that's risen from the dead. And I'm going to tell you something. If you've done as many funerals as I have, and you've looked at as many bodies as I have, I want to tell you what, when somebody can make somebody come up, a dead body come up out of the ground, buddy, you've got somebody's got power. And it just seems very simple to me that those who are following all these crazy false religions of the world would just back up a little bit and say, now let's just examine who's alive and who's not alive. Who has power over death? Who has risen from the dead? That proves its superiority over all other religions. None have power over death. Sin and death has conquered all of their leaders and all of their prophets, all of their so-called holy men. Death has conquered every one of them, but death did not conquer our Savior. Who is it alone in the history of mankind? That has conquered the grave and conquered death. It is Christ and Christ alone. The resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ is the basis of our justification. Listen carefully to Romans chapter 4 and verse 25. Who, talking about Jesus, was delivered for our offenses. He was sent to the cross, delivered for our offenses. But watch this. He was raised for our justification. You see, Jesus dying on the cross would not have brought life to you in and of itself without the resurrection because the resurrection was the evidence that God had accepted the payment for our sin. Many people never grab hold of this. The fact that God raised him from the dead is the word called propitiation in the Bible. It means this, that God, holy God, was satisfied That Jesus Christ paid the sin debt and paid for the sins of the world with his own body and and, and his own blood. And that being true, then God evidenced that satisfaction that the sin debt had been paid by raising him from the dead. That's why the Bible says that he was raised again for our justification. Without the resurrection, as Paul said, you are yet in your sins. That's why the resurrection ought to mean something to you. Amen. He is our perpetuation. He did satisfy the wrath of a holy God and the just judgment of a holy God against sin. And God raised him from the dead. It is also the resurrection of Jesus Christ that declares the victory of God's holiness and God's love and God's mercy and God's grace over sin, Satan, death and hell. And by the way, this morning, it's faith in Christ's death, burial, and resurrection that overcomes the world for you and I. For it says in 1 John 5, 4, whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. What faith? Faith in Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. And I want to say to the church this morning this. When all around me, the storm rages. When all around me, things crumble And when the sight mocks my faith, I reach out from my heart and from my spirit and say, I believe that he rose from the dead. Irregardless of what I see. And not only when I look at things around me, are you listening? 
Not only when I look things around me and it doesn't look like it. And when I look within me and I see the, the depravity and the disappointment and the failure and the sin. I say he's risen from the dead. You see, it's his resurrection that justifies us. It's that which gives us the victory even over our own failures in life. I want to beg of you this morning. Never. I've been reading a book one of the sisters gave me on Winston Churchill. And I, I, I doubt Winston Churchill was saved. I don't know. I hope he was. But the Bible says that the children of this world are wiser in their generation than the children of light. Isn't that a strange thing? But Winston Churchill had something that every Christian ought to have. And that was the ability to not give up and not give in. And Winston Churchill said, when all of Europe had been conquered, and when Hitler was standing at the doorstep of the English Channel, saying, I'm coming after you. Winston Churchill said, we will never quit fighting here. You will never whip us. We will fight you in the air. We'll fight you on the sea. We will fight you on the land. But you will never conquer us. We will never give in. We'll never give up. And whenever the devil comes at you and says, give up your faith, give up your faith, quit, quit, quit. There's no use. Tell him you will never because Christ is risen from the dead. We need some people with that kind of dedication. Say to your soul, he lives. He lives. I know he lives because he lives within my heart. The resurrection speaks of life. It speaks of living. We began with the statement that Jesus made, I am the resurrection and what? The life. Oh, I want to give you some wonderful news today that you already know. Just remind you, did you know Jesus Christ created this world? Oh, man alive, the pink dogwoods and the red buds, they're fixing to sprout and go. And I'm telling you, the Easter lilies is a jumping up and the rabbits are even thinking about making families. And everybody's in this resurrection mood, amen? Oh, I'm telling you something. Listen, I mean, take God's a God of wonderful creation. The leaves are fixing to come out on the trees and a wonderful, wonderful thing. He is the God of creation. He's the God of resurrection. He is also Jesus Christ, the God of salvation. He's the God of resurrection. Jesus Christ, now watch this. I know, what's saying. I know you know this, but he makes dead things live. He makes dead things live. Now, you don't tell you something. If you don't believe this, go plant a garden. That seed that you plant, has, it will die. But out of that death will come thousands of ears of corn you can eat and enjoy. And it's all over around you in nature. God has written this principle of resurrection upon us. Now let me tell you something. Religion will dress a corpse. But salvation will make a corpse get up. It will make a corpse breathe, walk, talk, and live. But religion will just put clothes on the corpse. And I want to say in 1982, I walked into a church service. On a Sunday night, a religious corpse. I had all the outside trappings on, but I was a dead person on the inside. And I remember on that night, just as Jesus did in Genesis chapter 1, the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the deep where it was void and without form. And then you know what God said? Let there be light. And when God shone his light, I could see myself for who I really was. I was a lost religious hypocrite heading toward the fires of hell. But his light shined further and I could look over yonder and see the cross of Calvary and see a Savior who died for me. And I saw the grace of God in the giving of his son. And I'm telling you that night, God raised a corpse up out and made him live. And for these 33 years now, I'm living in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when I called upon the Lord Jesus, he created a new creature in Jesus Christ. And I'm here standing before you this morning, proclaiming his blessed name because of what he did inside my heart. 
So when my faith is tried, and when your faith is tried, please rest your mind and your heart. Rest your spirit and your soul on this truth. Jesus is risen from the dead. And with this, everything's all right. Everything's all right. Everything's all right in my Father's house. You know why? Not because I feel good today or not because I don't feel good today, but because he's risen from the dead. I've have, over the past 33 years, buried a lot of people. I don't like funerals and I will not go to them hardly unless I'm preaching them. Don't like them. I like life. Don't like death. Besides that, I hear so much garbage at funerals, it just bothers me. I buried a lot of people, both saved and lost. I buried a lot of people from this congregation, and I could not prepare this message and think about resurrection without the faces of people down through the years that have been with us and who've gone on to glory. But when you bury people and deal with that, it wears on you. I don't know, maybe it doesn't you, but it does me. Because death is so final in one sense of the word. Somebody says, well, it's not finally the resurrection. I understand that, but I'm talking about, you don't, you know, listen, that person died, they're gone. I mean, it's, and uh, you want to help people. Death rips and death tears people from our lives. And so many times the undertaker, the funeral home people, they'll, you know, tell you where to stand and so forth, and they'll say, Brother Reggie, come over here and stand right here. And invariably, Brother Phil, I always stand at the head of the casket, and the casket's right here, and right there is straight down six foot. And right where I stand, you can look straight down six foot in the ground. You do do that enough times and do that with enough people you love, you're going to think about that a little bit. You're going to think about, am I telling these people the truth? Am I giving these people the hope? Lord, what can I say to help them? And I'm just saying this to you. It'll make you think. You stand by there and that person's in a casket and that casket's lowered into a concrete vault and that vault's lowered six feet down the ground. Resurrection starts being a pretty important subject to you. And uh, they kind of do their last deal and they kind of get everybody to leave, you know. And the old backhoe boy, he's sitting over just hoping everybody hurry up and go so he can get the dirt thrown over it and get back to town. Now, I'm not putting down backhoe guys, okay? I'm just saying that most people don't hang around for the backhoe to start throwing the dirt in on. We try to take the sting of it all away from us. But, folks, it's not a pretty picture. Death is mean. Death is cruel. And the resurrection will never mean a whole lot to you until you face death square in the face. But if you really look death in the face, the resurrection will get precious to you. When you start burying somebody that you love, you will lay hold of the resurrection more than anything else in the Bible because you want to know, oh, Lord, will I see that person again? And I want to tell you the best thing you could do this Easter season is to make sure that none of your family has to walk over your grave and wonder, where are you at? My, what foolishness. To be, let your heart beat one second away from eternity and not know for sure that you're saved. How unsettling and how cruel to leave to those of your loved ones not knowing are you saved. The last thing Brother Forrest Lovelace ever said to me is I love you, Brother Reggie.
and if there's no resurrection, then I have absolutely lived my life in vain. But there is a resurrection. The question this morning is this, as the pianist comes, which resurrection are you going to be in? It's not will you be in resurrection, it's the which one will you be in. Let's bow our heads together. Dear Lord, we thank you for life. And Lord, I've always felt like a man ought to live till he dies, not die while he lives. I believe, Lord, you said you came to give life and life more abundantly. And Lord, it's the truth. You have. And I want to thank you for the abundant life that you've given me and my family. I thank you, Lord, that you are our life. I thank you, Lord, that in Christ, Lord, I think about little Rowan getting saved this week, Lord. And Lord, help us to realize what a precious, precious thing the gospel is, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And my Father, today I just pray, Holy Spirit of the living God, sweep over this congregation today. Go only where you can go into the spirits and the hearts and the minds of these people. And Father, I pray those that are not saved today, Lord, I pray that they would bow their heart before you now and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Oh, Holy Ghost, warn them of the wrath to come if they reject the only salvation there is in Jesus Christ. And dear Lord Jesus, we just thank you that though this world will be set on fire, Christ is risen from the dead. God save people here today. I don't know any other way to say it. Pray that you'd save people. And I pray that you'd build saved people up in the faith that, Lord, the rest of it don't matter if Jesus is not risen from the dead. Help us to lay hold of that, dear God, through the storms of life. When everything else is blown away, help us, Lord, to know that you're risen from the dead. I want to thank you. Oh, God, I thank you for the truth. And now, God, do your work in this service today. As our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet right now. If you're here today and you're not saved, I'm going to ask you to step out from your seat and to come forward, find a place to kneel up here and call on the Lord to save you today. You say, Pastor, is it that simple? It's just that simple. Ask God to forgive you of your sins through the blood of Jesus Christ. Ask God to save you. Call upon, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I'm going to ask you to come quickly, quickly. I'm not going to tell you a long time, but I want to give you an opportunity to be saved today. I'll meet you here at the front. Personally, I will meet you, kneel with you, show you in the Bible how you can know that you're saved. Would you come right now? Right now, would you come? Anywhere in this building, I want you to know we love you and we care where you spend eternity. I want to remind you of something today. They don't make caskets just for old folks. I've buried, I've buried caskets not three foot long. I've buried teenagers. I've buried seniors in high school who were getting ready to graduate. You say, Reggie, you trying to scare me? I don't have to try to scare you. That's just the facts of life. That's just the truth of the, truth of the matter. And for you to deny that you don't have a guarantee that you'll, that you'll sleep in your bed tonight. Now is the accepted time. Today is the day. I'm asking you, if you don't know for sure that you're saved right now, I'm going to tell you something. You need to make sure of your salvation. Would you come? Would you come right now, quickly, anywhere across the building? You say, Reggie, I, I've told people I'm saved, and I, I, they'll find out. I, I, listen, quit worrying. Don't, don't let the fear of man snare you. You just break out. You do business with God. Let the Lord take care of what people think. That don't, that don't amount to nothing. Don't die and go to hell over what anybody thinks. Anybody want to come this morning? Anywhere in the building? Anywhere in the building? Anywhere. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this beautiful Resurrection Sunday that you've given us to live. Help us to live it to the fullest. We do praise and glorify your holy name. And Lord, I thank you for the life of Jesus Christ. God, it's so good. I thank you for it, Lord. I bless your holy name for it. 
I pray God give these folks a great Sunday today, Lord. Help them get their mind off what other people's doing and what they've done and all that other junk and help them get their eyes on a resurrected Savior. Help it to be the anchor of their faith, Lord, when the storms of life blow. That if everything else blows out, God is risen from the dead and I'm risen with Him. Lord, help these folks in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You're dismissed. We'll see you tonight. I'm going to preach on the resurrection tonight again unless the Lord changes my mind. Thank you for being here.